in Luke 135, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, you see, she was trying to reason within herself, how can this be? And she verbalized it to Gabriel. How can this possibly be? This makes no sense. I mean, how can it be that I could reason this out? And so verse 35 explains to her, and for this reason, the holy offspring shall be called the son of God. Now, what Gabriel is explaining to you and I through Luke, the physician, the doctor, is how God is going to prepare a body to be offered as a sacrifice for the sin of the world. John 1, Behold the Lamb of God that has come into the world for the sin of the world. And he is explaining to Mary why the virgin conception is going to be a miracle and it's necessary for Christ to be born in this way in order for him to be the savior of the world. And I'll explain that today. My text comes from Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 5, and I'm going to read it to you. Uh, the writer of Hebrew quotes Psalms 40, verse 6. Therefore, when he comes into the world, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offerings thou hast not desired. That's Old Covenant shadow Christology. But a body thou hast prepared for me. Verse 5, but a body thou hast prepared for me. A body thou hast prepared for me. In other words, the sacrifice that was offered in shadow Christology through a perfect genetic animals without blemish and spot, no growth defects, no uh, birth defects was now going to be transferred, which always was the picture of shadow Christology, onto when Christ would come into the world, that would be the sin of the world would be transposed to his body. Psalms 40, verse 6. And that's what Luke is talking about. This prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14 through a virgin, a body's prepared. And we'll, we'll talk about that today. In the subject, a body prepared for sacrifice. Luke 135. Let's pray. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it. And carnality, evidence of carnality in Christian life is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type, sins of the tongue, overt. How do we get out of carnality back into spirituality, which is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit that I received the moment I believed the gospel of Christ, that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised on the third day. That's called the gospel. It is the power of God to save everyone who believes. Romans 1.16, therefore I am saved by grace through faith and not of myself is a gift of God. Ephesians 2.8.9. The person who, who believes the gospel of Jesus Christ receives one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit under the new covenant church age is indwelling. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. John 14, 16 and 17. Passages that declare this. Spirituality is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, is walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Walking walking the spiritual life out into our everyday exercise of life. Galatians 5, 16 and 17, walk in the spirit, you will not walk in the flesh. These are in conflict with inside every believer's life. And it's based on choices we make. I can walk in the flesh and fulfill the desire for sin, or I can walk in the spirit and fulfill the desire to be honorable and righteous with God. 
So what do I do if I'm in carnality and I have per knowledge of personal sin? What do I do to get back into spirituality? I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin to, the, to God through Christ, if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That cleansing takes me back to the cross of Jesus Christ as a believer, not as an unbeliever for salvation, as a believer for sanctification, to get back into the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit where the power of the Christian life is lived, not in the flesh, but in the power of the Spirit. So I give you a moment to confess your sins in privacy in order for the Holy Spirit to teach and recall the Word of God, John 14, 15, and 16 chapters, you should read on that subject matter. Today we're talking about the body prepared for sacrifice, beginning with virgin conception and then birth. That has to occur in order for him to be qualified to go to the cross. That's the first step in getting him prepared, a body prepared for sacrifice for sin of the world. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that the Holy Spirit is a great influence of great ministry through the Christian life in the church age under the new covenant. I pray today, Father, as we come, we bring our sin to you because we want to be spiritual people and we can't do it in the flesh. We have to do it in the spirit. It's called spirituality. I pray today, Father, that we have confessed our sins and that we are ready for the Holy Spirit to teach, to recall, and that we might understand the significance of the Christmas story. It's not just about a baby, and it's not just about any baby, and not just any Jewish baby, but rather the holy offspring that is going to become a person born of Mary and be called the Son of God, be called Emmanuel, God with us. I pray today, Father, we might understand the significance of the body prepared through the mirac miraculous conception of the fertilization of Mary's egg to prepare him to be the Savior of the world in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, when Mary says, look, I don't know how this could possibly happen. He says, okay, for this reason. Remember that out of Luke 135, for this reason, the holy offspring that you're going to give birth to will be called the son of God, the son of God, not the son of Joseph, the son of God, the son of God. This is Hebrews 10.5 in the rea reality of the sacrifice for the sin of the world of John 1.29. Today we're going to examine Gabriel's doctrinal answer to Mary's question, how can this be since I'm a virgin engaged to be married? What is really interesting in Luke 1.35 in the Greek language is the use of and the absence, the presence and the absence of a definite article. Now, in English, we probably don't pay that much attention to the definite article because we're always looking at the words. But a definite article in the Greek language is dynamite. And I'm going to show you the importance of it in Luke 135. In Luke 135. In Luke 135. If you have a study guide, if you've downloaded a study guide from today's lesson, okay. If not later, you'll be able to do it, and you'll be able to see something. In the meantime, look at Luke 135 in your Bible with a piece of paper and a pencil. Take some notes. I'm going to show you something really important about the definite article or the word the. In Luke 1.35, the English translation says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The, the word the is not there. There's no definite article with the word Holy Spirit. 
So just note that there is no definite article. Without the definite article, if there's a definite article with the Holy Spirit, it's identifying the person of the Holy Spirit. If there's no, if there's no definite article, it's talking about the function, a function of the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you how important this is in the Greek language. If there's no definite article, it's talking about the function of the Holy Spirit. If there's a definite article, it's talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. There is no definite article with Holy Spirit in Luke 135 in the Greek language. So we're dealing with a function. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And he's talking, and we'll talk about this in a moment, but he's talking about a creative function of the Holy Spirit, a creative function of the Holy Spirit in fertilizing Mary's egg with divine DNA chromosome. No, there is no the, the a Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit will function. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High. There is no definite article with power and there is no definite article with the Most High. There is none. So we're not talking about the identi identifying power with the Most Holy as the person. The power of the person of the Holy Spirit, of the Most High. That's God, Most High God. We have the Holy Spirit, God, God the Holy Spirit, and we have God the Father discussed as the most power of Most High, no definite article. Therefore, it's a function, a creative function, the creative function of the Holy Spirit and the creative function of the power of Most High. Now watch this. So the two members of the Godhead are going to work creative miracle power. God the Holy Spirit and God the Father called the Most High, the sovereign Father of the plan of God. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of, of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, she needs reasoning in her mind because this is so impossible for the human mind and human logic and human affairs. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called. There is a definite article with the holy offspring shall be called, but there is none with the son of God. There is no definite article with the Holy Spirit. There is no definite article with the power of the Most High, neither the, the power nor the Most High. There is a definite article with the Holy Offspring, and there is no definite article with the Son of God. Now, what you have is three members of the Godhead described in 135. And none of them are connected with the definite article. The only definite article is, the, is with the only, the holy offspring. In other words, God is going to do, God the Holy Spirit and the Most High is going to do a creative miracle work, something apart from what is normal, A normal, a normal, a normal pregnancy. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. The power of the Most High is over going to shadow you. And that creative power of those two are going to create the Son of God. That's what Luke is telling you in the Greek. Gabriel's answer that he brings 
to us comes from the theology of Hebrews 10.5. God is preparing a body in its conception to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. Therefore, when he comes into the world, Hebrews 10, 5, he says, Sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. So today we're going to look at the significance of what Luke is trying to teach us, Luke the physician, about the miraculous conception that is necessary For Jesus to go to the cross. I have two points. <laughs> Here's point number one. The absence of the def Greek definite article in Luke 135, not with the Holy Spirit and not with the Most High and not with the Son of God. Three members of the Godhead emphasizing the importance of the creative power of God the Holy Spirit, God the Father the Most High, creating the Son of God that has to be prepared in such a way to qualify him from birth to death on the cross to be the Savior of the world. The absence of the definite article with the three members of the Godhead point to the creative power of God the Holy Spirit, God the Father creating God the Son. The creative power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the creative power of the Most High will overshadow you and for that reason, the, the holy offspring will be called Son of God. There are other things in this passage that are kind of important that I put on your paper. For example, with the creative power of the Holy Spirit, it says, will come upon you. Come upon you. When it says upon you, it's epi plus the accusative. Upon you. You're not going to do something to create this, Mary. You're not going to have sexual relations with a man. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. The creative, the creative power of the Holy Spirit is going to create a miracle in you. Also, and that's epi plus the accusative in the Greek word. That's a preposition. The word will come. The Holy Spirit will come upon, will come upon you. The, this word has epi, the, that same preposition, on the front of the word erkolmai, future, middle, indicative, future from Gabriel telling them that, and it being done. It's got epi on it. The preposition attached to the word will come. The word will come puts it in future tense. And the indicative is a, is a mood of reality. This will happen because God said so. God will bring this to pass. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and will come upon you to create a miracle in your womb. That's epi. It's used both in the verb and epi is used with the verb attached to a verb, a preposition attached to the verb, as well as separated from it to show that the creative power of the Holy Spirit, the creative power, the ability to create something out of nothing or to take something that is beyond the norm and add it to something that is the normal to create a miracle. I know you have to listen to this several times to get it. I'm just telling you what Luke's telling you. 
Then the absent of the definite article with the power of the Most High is the creative power of the Most High, the sovereign God, says will overshadow you. Now what's interesting about this word overshadow you, the reason it's overshadow and not just shadow the fulfillment of shadow Christology is about to come to Mary. Isaiah 7:14, 7, 700 years earlier that prophecy was, was given, is about, to, is about to come upon Mary. Overshadow, not shadow Christology. That shadow Christology is about to come to pass. That's Galatians 4:4. 4, 4. At the proper time in human history, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Galatians 4.4. 4. This word overshadow has epi on the front of it. it. That's where you get the word overshadow. It has epi on the front of it. The Holy Spirit is going to epi. And the Most High is going to epi. Is going to overshadow. The Holy Spirit is going to do the creative work with fertilizing the egg of Mary. And God is going to put a Shekinah glory over, over, that Shekinah glory is going to put, that's old covenant, is going to put the Shekinah glory over Mary's body and treat it like a temple because she is going to have the holy offspring in her womb. And look something. <laughs> Isn't that phenomenal? This word has epi, overshadow. It's spelled E-P-I-S-K-I-A-Z-O, future indicative. Now, here's what he's talking about. Let me tell you how we can reason this about a miracle. The Holy Spirit will create a perfect, unblemished why chromosome by unblemished means not blemished by Adam's original sin. If, if, if the father is a, a human, this is not going to work because the male is the carrier of Adam's sin. Joseph cannot be the father. No, no human male can be the father. God has to be the Father, and it's going to be done by the creative power of the Holy Spirit fertilizing Mary's egg with divine DNA. 23 Y perfect chromosomes will fertilize Mary's messianic genealogy X chromosome. You can read about that in Matthew, the first chapter, 1 through 17. It's laid out in Matthew 1, Mary's genealogy, as well as Luke 3, 23 through 38. And why is God doing that, that creative power of work? Why is he doing that? He's doing it to prepare a perfect body for the sacrifice of sin. Shadow Christology was offered until the day when Christ would come and fulfill that prophecy and would die on a cross for our sins of humanity. All of the sins from Adam, from the first Adam to the very last human being. First Peter 2.24. First Peter 2.24. Write that down. And he himself, or he alone, bore our sins in his body on the cross. Where did he bear our sins? On his body. That body prepared in con in, at conception. When the Holy Spirit fertilized Mary's egg with divine DNA and produce the hypostatic man of the universe, undiminished deity and true humanity, 100% God and 100% man and one person of the universe, never anything like it before and never again. It's a miracle. 
It was a miracle of Romans 4.17. God can call into existence that which does not exist. You see, that's what the writer is talking about in Psalms 40, verse 6, and in Hebrews 10, 5. He's talking about what the theology of the new covenant church age is about, 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself, or he alone, bore our sins on his body on the cross. Hebrews 10, 10. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We take part in the Eucharist, communion, the Lord's Supper, however you describe it, out of 1 Corinthians 11, 25 and 26. The bread represents the body of Christ that bore our sins on the cross. That's the Eucharist. And the cup represents the blood of the new covenant offered for our sins. That's why we do the Eucharist. It's one of the great it's one of the great ordinances of the church. 1 Peter 1.19, with the precious blood, and with the precious blood, as a lamb unblemished, no birth defects, and spotless, no growth defects, the blood of Christ. But with precious blood, as a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. The body and the blood and your salvation. Not only does the body have to be prepared from conception to birth, he has to be, be born a free man outside the slave market of Adam's sin. You see, in order for him to go to the cross, he has to live from birth to his death on the cross without sin, without volitional sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin for us on his body, on the, on the, on the tree, on the cross that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The creative power of the Most High would overshadow Mary's pregnancy because of the holy offspring that she was carrying in her womb. This is the idea under the old covenant of the Shekinah glory over Mary's body viewed as the temple of God because she was carrying the messianic savior of the world called the Son of God. Exodus, the 40th chapter, verse 34, in describing the Shekinah glory. Then the cloud covered over the tent of the meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. You want more description of the Shekinah glory? Read Matthew 17, 5, in what's called the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Shekinah glory. And connect the dots. The Shekinah glory over Mary. The Shekinah glory over Christ to carry him to the cross. The transfiguration, the halfway point from birth to death. The transfiguration. The Shekinah glory. Ah, oh, you should read your Bible. It's full of great information. Point number two. Once the use of the Greek definite article, I want you to notice, the, having looked at the absence of the definite article, I want you to now notice the use of the definite article with the holy offspring. It has the definite article T-O, the word hagios, H-A-G-I-O-S, holy, and geneo, G-E-N-N-A-O, talking about genetics, present passive participle, not of a singular neuter of the holy offspring. That's, that's the idea of offspring. 
marry her, her, her chromosome is going to carry the messianic genealogy. The absence of the definite article with the Son of God was used to emphasize the bib biblical messianic ge genealogy seed that lies with Jesus Christ, which lies with Mary's X, X chromosomes. Look. Go in your Bibles to Galatians with me. Now listen, you can't listen to this one time and get it. You got to study it. You pull down our tapes off from doctrinal studies and study this. Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. It does not say into seeds, plural, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed that is Christ. Now that that seed is going to be identified in his, in his birth as Jesus, the Savior of the world, who has come to save his people from their sins. The absence of the definite article has placed the, the absent has placed the emphasis on the creative power of the Holy Spirit and God, the Most High, uh, cr creating the Son of God. But what Mary's got in her womb is a definite article with a holy offspring. All about the person that's in her. And he told Mary and he told Joseph, when he is born, you call him Jesus. He is going to be known as Jesus Christ. The Savior. Listen to Galatians 4, 4 through 7. When the fullness of time came, perfect timing in the plan of God in human history, God sent forth his son. That's Luke 135. Takes us all the way to the cross. God sent forth his son. Born of a woman, born under the law. Isaiah 714, so that he might redeem salvation, those under the law, that we, church age believers, that we might receive the adoption as sons, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave of Adam's sin, but now you are a son, and if a son, then an heir, an heir through God your Abba Father. Do you understand the dynamics of that? A miraculous birth, a miraculous life. He who knew no sin became sin for me and you. Is, no, is, there, is there no doubt in your mind why would you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day? You receive a miraculous being born again, a miracle being born again. Born again. John, the third chapter, Titus, the third chapter. Born again, regenerated, redeemed, reconciled. The propitious work of Christ has freed me from the condemnation of judgment. Ma, ma, ma. Therefore, you are no longer a slave. Now you are a son. If a son, an heir, an heir through God. The renaissance of the new covenant. Discussing Luke 135 writes, Jesus Christ was untainted by the genetic influence of Adam's fall. You know why? Virgin conception by the Holy Spirit. God overshadowed Mary's temple carrying the Son of God to birth. My, my, my. Do you understand any of that? Jesus Christ was born outside the slave market of Adam's sin. 
and thus was qualified to redeem all mankind born to inside the slave market of Adam's sin and is redeemed by the grace salvation offered through the gospel that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. And you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. It is a miracle. Salvation is a miracle birth. And you are born of the Holy Spirit. You are conceived and birthed by the Holy Spirit. My, my, my. What a wonderful thing. 2 Corinthians 5.21, I remind you again, God made Christ, who knew no sin, he was impeccable, to be sin on our behalf on the cross, so that we might become, that we might become, we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's a gift. Righteousness is positional truth. It is a gift of salvation. It's one of the 50 things you receive you can never lose in time and eternity. You are made righteous. What were we beforehand? Unrighteous. Romans 3.10. There are none righteous. No, not one. But when you come to Christ through faith, you are saved by grace. You become the righteousness of God for time and eternity. It's a gift of grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Gave him. For what? For the cross. That whosoever believes in him, his work on the cross, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, his burial and raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. When you enter into Christ, you enter into eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish. One of the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin, perishing. All men are born perishing. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should no longer perish but have eternal life. Do you see what's the opposite of perishing? The opposite of perishing is eternal life. And the only way you can get out of perishing, separated from God in time, is to be separated without the gospel of Christ, is to be separated from God for eternity in the lake of fire. Perishing. But if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the moment you believe the gospel that he died for your sins was buried and raised from the dead, the moment you believe that by faith, you believe it. You are no longer perishing. You are removed from that into eternal life. The solution to perishing is eternal life. How do I get it? Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. I offer that to you today. What's holding you back? What's holding you back from doing that? You are perishing. If you die, boom. You will be separated from God forever. What is my alternative? Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and have a miracle birth. That's what Christmas is about, a miracle birth, a miracle conception. Um, the whole thing of Christmas is a miracle conception. You can be born again in a miracle by believing the gospel and being born again. A relationship with God for time and eternity. What do I have to do to be saved, Ron? You've got to believe that Jesus, you got to believe that Jesus died for your sins that separate you from God. The Adamic curse. 13 judicial charges. Go to our website and pull down the 50 things that are free. You never lose in time and eternity. When you believe it, you receive it. It's a gift. 
It's not of works, it's a gift. Believe. You got to believe it. You believe it, you, you receive it. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way to study a body prepared for sacrifice of sin. Let us be wise. Let us be one of the wise men that come to Christ for worship. To believe that Jesus came into this world, was sent by God to die on a cross, to bear our sins so that we wouldn't have to bear them, to give us a new life, a miraculous birth called Be Born Again. I want to thank you for it, Father. I pray those that are listening today would have the courage to believe right where they are, to say to God, I believe that you sent your son to die for me. He was buried and raised on the third day, not only to save me, to give me eternal life. And God is now my Abba Father, and I've been adopted into the family of God for time and eternity, and I want to thank you, Father, for that wonderful gift in Jesus' name this Christmas season. Amen.